I think Malcolm has to shift his um, political ideology uh, to the right. He's betraying the LNP party members, the rank and file. No other federation is as centralised as we are, and that wasn't the intention of the founders. People who, who should be concerned about the future of Western civilization of Judeo-Christian culture, mm. because ultimately that's what's at stake here. I can tell you, by people voting One Nation, they got, or will get, abortion on demand in Queensland. I don't think there is a scientific or really? sort of definition of life, I don't. This is complete nonsense. People do not live their lives as the left would have us live it. But in the 19th century, the dominant meaning of secular in Australia was not sort of the absence of religion. And you shouldn't rule the church out uh, as an institution. Other institutions get to have their say. A child does best on average when raised by biological uh, married parents. I will fight for Australia's rights, our freedoms, our way of life. I'm an anti-feminist because I think it's oppressive, I think it's anti-male, I think it's anti-femininity. Now, it may be a very weak Brexit, but I'll tell you what, Brexit of any kind and leaving those treaties as well. That's the best yeah. ever interview. Yeah. Well, Michael Parkinson, you've got nothing on this book. <laughs> G'day and welcome to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello, and tonight we're recording with a live audience. Now, the topic of tonight's interview is called Emily's List. Uh, Emily's List is something I know a little bit about, and uh, I'm very disappointed that it has any influence in my nation because I think the most uh, serious moral dilemma of our day that needs solution, just like William Wilberforce's generation needed to solve the problem of slavery, our generation needs to solve the problem of killing our citizens in our clinics. And I'm talking about uh, abortion. It's just inexcusable to deliberately kill an innocent living human. That's my view, and I'm happy to debate that with anybody. Uh, but Emily's List, what I know about Emily's List is it's uh, amongst other things, incredibly invested in promoting and proliferating abortion in societies around the world. But uh, joining me tonight on the panel is uh, Tishan Johnson, who's an executive director, the executive director of Cherished Life Queensland. What you may not know about Tishan Johnson, if you've uh, met her before, is that she actually used to work for Bob Carr when he was the Premier of New South Wales. So welcome to the show, Tishan. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Now, Cherish Life Queensland is a pro-life organisation yes. opposed to abortion and euthanasia. Correct, yes. Are there any other topics that you deal with regularly? We just cover those two. For, so the right to life from conception until natural death. Okay. Yes. Now, um, Cherish, Executive Director of Cherish Life Queensland is a vastly different role to working in the Premier's Department um, for a Labor Premier. Yes. Um, what made you first start investigating and researching the background of Emily's List? Well, Labor's taken a very dark path. Traditionally, many years ago, it was the party for the family, the underdog, the working class. And in the last, probably since the 90s, it's really been into abortion actually since 1983, but there's been this militant wing of the Labor Party, if, if I can use that expression, that really have promoted and um, basically removed all this restraint uh, from abortion. That's their mm. goal. And I'm like, what is happening to the Labor Party? Why are they going so left? Part of it is the influence of the Greens, I believe. They're trying to capitalise. They're trying to steal Greens' Absolutely. votes back. Yeah. So they're getting more extreme. But the other thing is the presence of EMILY's listers. So EMILY's list, EMILY actually stands for an acronym. So early money is like yeast. It's in reference to uh, campaigning. Um, so get money in early in the campaign. It can help you raise money later on. But then it's um, there. Basically, you have to be a pro-choice or pro-abortion woman to be part of EMILY's list. 
and then if they like you and you know you kind of commit to uh, unrestrained abortion access if you get a, a role in parliament mm. um, they will help fund your campaign or they'll fund it entirely in the USA it's about 40 45 million dollars a year wow. for Democrats so they're the equivalent of labor yeah. obviously here and then labor um, is about 350,000 a year so we have a lot of prominent Emily's listers here in Queensland and right around Australia now I actually when you say they have to be in favour of unrestrained, unrestricted abortion on demand. Uh, I'm aware of an incident of a female Democrat um, Congress or some politician in America, Democrat, yeah. who was elected with the help of Emily's List. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a bill came up about partial birth abortion, um, which involves delivering a baby feet first all the way until just the head yeah. is inside the mother and then severing the spine. It's so disgusting. Um, and she believed this was a bridge too far in abortion and voted against this wow. uh, this measure. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard this story, but essentially Emily's list dumped her like hotcakes, yep. but who they believed was an excellent um, candidate to help raise as much money for as possible previously, mm. weren't interested in her at all after she... Um, found that there was a type of abortion that she couldn't support at a certain stage. I, absolutely, it's criminal. It's like um, they have this very, uh, I would say, violent feminist philosophy that the highest uh, level of feminism is a right to kill your baby up until birth or even past birth. It's very violent, it's very perverse, mm. and it's um, it's not even a popular opinion. Uh, we did polling during the recent uh termination of pregnancy bill fight here in Queensland, only 3% of women actually agree with abortion up to birth in Queensland. Wow. So it's an extreme view by community standards. Yeah. Now, um, they would, of course, object to... We don't, we don't have a um, pro-abortion advocate here, but um, speaking for them as I can yeah. um, occasionally without any enthusiasm, they would object to the way you said that, the, the right to, uh, for a woman to kill her baby. Mm. Um, they want to call it a, a fetus or or some other name. Now I've actually got a, a t-shirt in my um, in my shop which has a picture of a pre-born person, yes. a fetus, and it's got the word fetus there. And the Latin translation to English just means little one. Yes. Uh, but the reason I have the picture there is because I don't care if you call it a fetus. Yeah. I don't care if you call it a brick or a gumboot. <laughs> It doesn't change what it is when you give it a different name. Yes. Scientifically, genetically, embryologically, biologically, mm -hmm. there's no dispute that it is a living human. That's exactly uh, right. So call it whatever name you like. Um, Pro-abortion, Emily's List, is all about killing that life yeah. within with with um, complete abandon for the moral or ethical consequences. Or at least having that right to do it. Okay, I'm going to give birth tomorrow. I should be able to kill it today and no one can make me feel bad. That's their philosophy. Yeah. It's very extreme. So with Emily's List, it's a, it's a huge American thing. Mm -hmm. um, when and how did it start in America? It started in 1983. Um, there's different... People, some some people say Soros is kind of conspiracy theory, but a lot of the donations in Australia are actually from political parties. We can guess which political parties. Um, and it's, to Emily's List? Yes, right. directly to Emily's List. And it's basically a, a very crude tool of the abortion lobby um, just to kill babies up until birth. Does Emily's List in America or Australia um, have any other agenda that it wants other than increasing the number of women in Parliament mm -hmm. um, and conditional upon them being abortion. Is there anything else that they're trying to achieve? They do say they mentor women who want to go into politics, but their main policy platform, their main goal is unrestricted access to abortion. Okay. Yeah, that's evident in the, what they do. So how many uh, Emily's List members, how many members of Emily's List are now members of parliaments in Australia and, and how long have they been gaining a foothold here? Close to 100 and we have eight here in Queensland, that's just at a uh, state level and then at a federal level in Queensland we have about 
five or six, and then we have three or four trying to be candidates this election. Okay. Um, so it, they've got quite a strong stranglehold. In um, state parliament, we saw the termination of pregnancy bill go through. This is Queensland, and eight Emily's listers led by Jackie Trad, who heads up the left faction of the Labor Party, which is the biggest faction in this term of government. So off the top of your head, who are the, the most famous or notorious um, members of Emily's list that you know of around Australia, federally or any state. Yeah, so Catherine King, the shadow federal health minister, who's really pushing these late-term abortion laws, well, these extreme unrestricted abortion laws as a federal... Uh, Free abortion, new federal policy exactly. for the Labor Party. Catherine King, Emily's list, Penny Wong, uh, Terry Butler here in Griffith. There's a lot of them. Um, Jackie Trad State, um, Nikki Boyd State level huge they've got a huge influence and the thing is if anyone objects if they're a man they're like you're a man you can't you can't enter this debate you're offending me and if it's a woman it's kind of like they just shut them down as well it's very aggressive very manipulative yeah. they use a very convincing language like choice and julia gillard uh she was at emily's list yes yep. yep absolutely yep we'll put a uh, we'll put a list of the um of the current uh, politicians, members, and um, seeking candidate. Yep. Um, we'll put a list beneath the um, video in the description so you can find that out. And uh, Cherish Life Queensland also has a blog on it with a, a lot of detail. Yes, and the list of candidates as well. Yes, yep. we do. We're writing a second blog on it. Very good. Yes. Uh, now, what's your thoughts on the announcement by um, federal labor mm -hmm. that abortion is now their campaign policy. They're going to make sure that South Australia, New South Wales, um, and is there any other state? That's it. That South Australia and New South Wales change their state laws yeah. to make abortion on demand without restrictions legal, um, effectively without restrictions. Yeah. Uh, they're going to build a facility in Tasmania, Tasmania mm -hmm. where there um, isn't one currently. Yeah. Uh, and they're going to make sure that anyone who wants an abortion gets one around Australia for free, and they're going to make it against the law uh, or a requirement for funding that you provide abortions. Yeah, and blackmail... What's the details on that funding question? Right, the funding is um, they're going to put a lot of pressure on COAG, so when all the states and territories right. meet together, and if they don't, if they're not compliant yeah. in supplying free abortions, so that, that means uh, public hospitals will be performing abortions up until birth. Yeah. At the moment in Queensland, only about 10% of abortions are in public hospitals. Um, so if they don't agree to that provision, if they don't allocate money, the states or territories, in in, uh, basically in spite, the federal government, if Labor get in, will withhold funding from them, up to billions of dollars, one report said, in health funding, because they won't allow abortions to be like on demand, you know, go and get my car service, go and get an abortion, but it's all free. Man, it's a very good reason why we need the states to be able to raise their own revenue instead of relying That's on centralised yeah. government. We'll um, chat about that a little bit more. Um, so... Exactly, exactly um, how successful have Emily's list been in getting their candidates? What's the what's the rate of failure or success for Emily's list? That's uh, a really candidates? good question. I don't actually know, but we know there's a high proportion of Emily's listers in very significant positions. I mean, the former prime minister was an Emily's lister. Right. Arguably the most. That's pretty successful. Yeah, huge. Second most powerful woman in Queensland government, Jackie Trad, is an Emily's sister. Yep. Penny Wong, very successful shadow health minister, Emily's sister. They're very successful. Um, they get the numbers. They get a number of them. There's a lot of women who want to be politicians, and they're mentored and they groom them and they try to pick the best candidates for a particular seat. Mm. Then they pay for their campaigns, whether it's all of it or a portion of it. Okay. So yeah. Brilliant. We're going to take a, a quick break right now, and when we come back, we're going to uh, bring on the first of our federal Senate candidates, and we'll start talking more about the coming federal election. Welcome back. Uh, this is Palo Talk, and it's the first time in Queensland we're interviewing and recording the interview with a live audience. Um, so we're actually going to be adding extra people to the, the conversation and the interview as we go tonight. And then the audience is going to be able to SMS some questions in. 
and uh, we'll include them in the conversation as well. And uh, hopefully this format works. Um, write in, comment beneath the video how you think it's working, uh, what you think we should do better, do differently, or just go back to a closed set and uh, short recording. But anyway, let's uh, see if we can make this work and hopefully do it more often. Now joining uh, Tishan Johnson, Executive Director of Cherish Life and myself, is Lyle Shelton. Lyle Shelton is the former Managing Director of the Australian Christian Lobby for over 10 years and is also the lead Senate candidate for the Australian Conservatives in Queensland. Welcome to Pello Talk, Lyle. Thanks very much, Dave. I feel like I'm part of history tonight uh, with this great initiative that you've started. Thank you. Yeah, look, I, I hope it uh, does work well, but um, we'll just have to make it as good as we can and let the people decide. They will. And now, just one little correction to your intro. Um, I was managing director for five years, but I did work there for 10 years. Oh, okay. But it, it felt like a lifetime. I felt like <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I'm I'm ecstatic with how the, um, and you must be as well. It's a, It'd be a shame to see it fall apart after you left and encouraging to see it go leaps and bounds ahead. I don't think there's any danger of it falling apart, but uh, no. it's certainly fantastic to see uh, Martin Isles, who took over from me and, and the team there, just doing amazingly well and really stepping up in the nation. And uh, ACL is an organisation that Australia desperately needs. Yeah, it really is. Um, and I, I think I've heard Martin say that the the number of active supporters, not just email lists, but the number of active supporters in ACL exceeds the membership of both major parties combined. Yeah, look, it's um, it's got a supporter base somewhere around 150,000 or so. It was uh, well over 100,000 when I left, so you can see it's continued to grow That's huge. Uh, under Martin's leadership. And um, this is a constituency that is uh, starting to become more and more active. ACL's getting them campaigning. Uh, they are uh, engaging with a new uh, modern campaigning techniques and um, this is a time in our nation where the voice of the Christian constituency really does need to be heard as we're running a million miles away from the truth essentially. Yeah. Now you decided to leave and essentially get into partisan politics instead of non-partisan lobbying. What was the main catalyst for that? I think the main catalyst um, was Towards the end of the marriage campaign, I felt like there was a shift um, occurring in my life. Um, I'd been at ACL for 10 years, loved it, of course, and uh, had uh, been given some amazing opportunities there. But I, I saw during the back end of the marriage campaign that um, we're obviously about to lose something very precious in our nation that was very grievous to me personally, uh, not only for what obviously marriage stood for, but um, because the way the law is crafted, how that affects freedom of speech and freedom of religion and what children are taught at school about gender in particular. And I saw that there were many good people in the parliament on both sides of politics, Labor and Liberal, who believed what I believed about marriage. But because of political correctness, because of the Greens influence, um, because of fear, because of wanting to curry favour with the media perhaps, uh, many good people were afraid to speak out and there were very few that were willing to sustain the debate in the public square. And mm -hmm. I feel that that's why we lost. Um, that's why we lose issues like abortion because good people don't have the courage or don't feel they right. have the um, ability to sustain the debate over a long period of time, which of course is what our opponents do. They get up every day and they yeah. campaign, we yeah. don't. Now, what awareness did you have in your lobbying role of Emily's List? Oh, we were very aware of it. Um, we and we were involved in many abortion campaigns. Uh, we would fight often side by side with um, groups like Cherish Life and and others in the other states. Uh, the Right to Life movement is very uh, strong in this nation. Uh, but um, you just knew that. Um, if uh, female Labor politicians were on the job, um, it wasn't even worth going after their vote. And they would influence um, politicians in the conservative side, even in the National Party. Emily's um, List? Absolutely. Well, now, the Emily's List uh, MPs in Labor, they would form these uh, groups of um, particularly female politicians. You saw it very um, strong in the 2008 um, embryo cloning debate, which is a pro-life debate about killing human uh, embryos, mm -hmm. which the, the parliament passed uh, very narrowly. Uh, and there was a, a cross-partisan group um, that included uh, the National Party, um, 
and uh, Labor and, of course, Liberal who, who work together as a group. But, but Emily, Emily's list, you know, is, I, I, in my view, that that's probably the most potent and toxic, I guess, of, of the mix there in terms of being a catalyst. And um, do you know, like, what kind of pressure they apply to... Um, I, I don't know if, if this is a thing or not. Do they apply pressure to non-members in the Labor Party? Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. And Tisha would, would probably know that better than me. But w what I saw in, in many abortion debates, um, you know, th there was a few that came up. There was um, an instance where the Liberal Senator Guy Barnett instigated a Senate inquiry into Medicare funding of late-term abortion. Now, that was at about 2009, I think, from memory, maybe maybe 2010. Um, people just went apoplectic over that. And, and particularly the women in the parliament uh, across parties. And, and what you saw is that these very strong bonds uh, began to form across the, the partisan divide. And it was like this issue was even more powerful uh, and, and drew people together in a, in a more powerful way than their party allegiances. And so they would work very hard against anything that would, would even touch abortion. And, and you think about the, the Barnett uh, Senate inquiry, it was just an inquiry into whether you know, taxpayers should be forced to fund brutal late-term abortion where babies feel pain and they're torn apart in the womb. That, that's what that debate mm. was about. Mm. But uh, it didn't get past first base. Well, it got to inquiry stage, actually, which was incredible in itself. Yep. Um, but then it was very quickly buried once the inquiry was held because um, all these protection mechanisms with Emily's voice, uh, Emily's list uh, at the forefront, mm -hmm. um, shutting it down. Yep. Now, what's? Uh, let me ask two questions. What's the Australian Conservatives' party position on um, the proposed uh, legislation um, after if Labor gets in power? Um, what's your personal position? Would you vote to block it or or support it? And just generally, what's the, the party's position um, on abortion? Yeah, we're, we're a pro-life party. Um, Senator Cory Bernardi, who's the party leader, is unashamedly pro-life and has quite a few scars from uh, you know, being forthright about that position. He wrote about it in his book, The Conservative Revolution. And, and again, of all the things they picked out in the book, that was one of two things they chose to criticise him over uh, and tried to demonise him for. Who's they? Um, they, <laughs> yeah, uh, the the left wing media, that the people that are okay. you know that run that other show that happens on a Monday night called Q and A, that's a bit like <laughs> this one. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, so so he, he certainly worn the scars of um of being pro life and is proudly so. In relation to federal Labor's proposal to uh, provide free abortions in hospitals and and withdraw Commonwealth funding for health if if hospitals won't provide free abortions, which I just think is just perverse. Mm. Um, we're obviously against that. And we as a party uh, were, as far as I know, the only ones that have issued a media release uh, opposing that. Excellent. Well, after the next, um, after this break, we're going to ask another party um, if they've got an official position on it. And uh, we might also talk about some other federal election issues coming up after the break. Uh, Steve Dixon from Pauline Hanson's One Nation. Good day, my Aussie friends. This is Michael Brown. I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus saved in 1971, author, activist, radio host. And every day I'm introduced on the radio as your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. To that end, I would love to come and serve the Church of Australia and the nation of Australia at the Church and State Summit in 2020. My heart burns to equip you, to strengthen you. Friends, we're called to swim against the tide, to go against the grain, to be the salt, to be the light, to make a difference. And if we don't speak, if we don't act, we have to apologize to our kids and grandkids, but it's not too late for revival. It's not too late for a gospel-based moral and cultural revolution. So partner together. I would love to be able to come do this summit, do some extra church teaching and preaching, equip and strengthen so that I can stand by you and help you to shine the light in your great country. The tide can still be turned in Jesus' name. I hope to see you next year. Welcome back to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello. With me on the panel tonight is Tishan Johnson, Executive Director of Cherish Life Queensland, uh, Australian Conservatives Queensland Senate candidate Lyle Shelton. And now joining the panel is Steve Dixon, who's also a Senate candidate for Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party 
here in Queensland as well. Welcome, Steve. Dave, thank you very much. It's great to be here with this fantastic group of people you've got on stage and the big audience. Yeah, it's huge. I think we've got about 25 people here tonight. It's uh, the quality of the people that count. It's a really good start. Now, you were a member of parliament here in Queensland for the state um, government for 11 years, a bit over 11 years? That's correct. I was a member of the Liberal Party originally. I started as an independent. Uh, the Liberal Party, three senators come and tap me on the shoulder and ask me to run for them, and I did when I was a councillor. Okay. And I won that seat against the sitting Minister of Government. And that was when I was with the Liberal Party. And then I helped convince my colleagues to form the LNP. So the LNP came together and eventually we got Campbell Newman to come on board and we won government. I became a minister in that government. So I've, I've got a little bit of experience in government. Yeah, indeed. Now, you decided to, while a sitting member of Kiwana or Budrum? Budrum. Budrum at the, at the time, you, you decided that you would recontest the next election um, as part of One Nation Party. Correct. Um, and so you effectively changed there and then and became the member for Butterham for as, as a, a part of the One Nation Party. And you lost that election, unfortunately. Um, how did you come to that decision of leaving the LNP to join One Nation? Well, I, I feel really pleased that I can actually say this on live TV in front of a lot of people because I've, I've pretty well kept that to myself for most of my time. Since the 13th of January 2017, I um, let's just say I've got a very, very big experience with a bloke called God, and uh, I had to make a decision in my life whether or not I'm going to move forward at the direction of a political party uh, that was really going nowhere and has basically become one party with the, the Labor Party and the Greens. I, I don't see anything different between those three parties today. I think they've forgotten that they actually work for people. I think that they've forgotten that they actually should be looking after everyday human beings and they should be making sure that we don't kill babies. And I think the Labor Party are experts at that. They're led by the Greens and by the look of it, Emily's list as well. But I was very disappointed at the last vote they had in the Queensland Parliament where three LNP members crossed the floor and voted with Labor to kill babies. That was disgusting. It was disgusting. Absolutely. Those, those members should not be um, returned to, to candidacy. They should be dumped by their members. But David, to continue that thought, I, I decided it was time to make a stand, to make a difference, and I think I've done that, and I've basically helped, I suppose, change One Nation a little bit to the way that it was. It was perceived as a, a party of racists. Uh, it was seen as a party that uh, may be not heading in the right direction, and I can make a point very clear. We have Indian candidates, we've had Chinese candidates, we've got Indigenous candidates, my actually future daughter-in-law is a Korean girl, so you know I really don't think I qualify as a racist and I don't think any of my colleagues do. But what I do see is a, a group of people that come from many and varied areas. Many of them are you know, Christians, which I like, and I think we're making big changes in the world, just a little bit at a time, but I think that's what we all should do as human beings. I want to come back to the subject of racism eventually, but just sticking with Emily's list um, and abortion right now, uh, you're a Christian and your personal position, um, I'm, I'm going to ask, is it Please. for or against? How would you vote if elected to the Senate um, personally um, if Labor presents this bill about making abortions free across Australia? David, I'm, I'm probably very fortunate because I've already voted in Parliament. Uh, myself and the Catters were the ones that stopped the bill going forward that was proposed by the member for Cairns and actually it was put up by Jackie Trout. I think he was just the convener of that bill. Mm -hmm. uh, we stopped that dead. And I, I have no hesitation. A member for Marani voted against the bill that was put forward recently, which was successful, supported by three LNP members, which absolutely disgust me. But uh, Stephen Andrews is very much a Christian person as well. And he's a South Sea Island, the first one ever elected to the Queensland Parliament. And he's a One Nation member? He is. He's yep. our, one, our single One Nation member in the Queensland Parliament. Yeah, right. And if I do become a senator, absolutely, I'll be voting against anything of that kind. I, I've not seen the literature yet, and I would love to see it, but what's been proposed here on the floor this evening, how could anybody support that? I mean, the truth yeah. is it's killing babies. Let's call it what it is. Yep. Yeah. yeah, whatever you call it, it's a living human. Absolutely. Um, indisputably. Now, what's... One Nation's party position on abortion. What's Pauline's position on well, abortion? I'm very fortunate. I'm, I'm doing uh, a video, I think, on the 26th with uh, one of the organisations that actually comes from this group, I think. 
Shelley, is it Francis? Shelley Francis? What is the lady's name? Whatever Wendy. her name is. Wendy? Oh, Wendy. Wendy Francis. Forgive me. I always, forgive me, Wendy. <laughs> but I'm doing a video with Wendy next week and I'll be saying this publicly then as well. But I rang Senator Hanson. I wanted to get her take on it because she's the leader of our party. And she said, we are supporting the existing laws that were in place in Queensland prior to Labor changing them. The only way that she would ever support abortion is if it was going to, a woman was going to lose her life or there is extenuating circumstances that the health of the child, the mother, you know, that would be a call a doctor would have to make, but we are very clear. Our, our point will be to leave in place. The legislation was in place prior to Labor changing it here in Queensland. Now, the phrase health of the mother is basically a loophole that lets you have abortion on demand because it includes things like if your blood pressure goes up, if you're feeling um, Dave, kind I'll, of I'll, but, I'll butt in on that one if she's dying. Right. It's pretty clear. There's, there's no if, buts and maybes. This is about if somebody's going to lose their life, a decision has got to be made then and there. And I can imagine a doctor's going to make that decision. Yeah. And I think on many occasions the child lives and the mother dies, which is a terrible thing to say, but it happens a lot. Yeah, look, uh, I don't think uh, life-saving measures have been denied to any woman anywhere um, because of laws against abortion. Um, and, um, you know, there's allegations of it, but they're extremely exaggerated, happen. misrepresented yeah, and, exactly. and false. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. Um, not in Australia. Certainly not in Australia, certainly but not. but even in some of the international cases that have been reputedly done. So um, life of the mother should always, life-saving measures should always be, be advocated and nobody who's pro-life, I think, would ever um, oppose that. Um, so what are your thoughts as, as you're hearing this explanation about Emily's, Emily's list tonight? Um, you, you had a chance to, before you came tonight, to maybe do some of your own research. Um, does it concern you at all that they've got so much influence on significant social policy in Australia and are yet largely unheard of? David, I, I, I think it's become an epidemic in politics across the world. Uh, I think the best thing that's ever happened in this world, to be brutally honest, is that Donald Trump has been elected president of the United States mm -hmm. because he actually has made a stand on a lot of these issues that we're talking about here tonight. And political parties are being influenced by Emily's List Group. And I know that they get about $240 million since 1985, and I've only started this in the last couple of days. Uh, I think the last, the lady's name who invented this is Elaine Malcolm. Uh, I think she really has got a, a lot of questions to be answered, to be honest, for what she started. I mean, she's the leader in killing babies in the United States, and it's from the Democrats, as you put very clearly, which is the equivalent of Labor. And let's tie the Greens in. I'm sure yep. they're all in together. Absolutely. And I, I, I just think we've got to do what we can to push back against that. And I think it's, uh, it's a sad day, really, because the way things are going in this country, we're probably going to end up with a Labor government. You may not have heard today, but uh, in the Australian, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia has come out and said they're going to put one nation last on their ballot paper again, as they did in the Queensland election. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a Labor government in Queensland. And I blame Tim Nichols directly for that. It was a decision that he made. Uh, he may have been in partnership with one nation, but would that have been a bad thing? I don't think so. We wouldn't have had abortion. We wouldn't have tree clearing laws that are in place in our state right now. And I think the same thing is uh, heading down that path equally at a federal government level. I'm extremely disappointed that the Prime Minister of Australia has come out today to put One Nation last. Um, wasn't the One Nation preference strategy in the Queensland election to just preference every incumbent last? Now, what happened was we tried to broker a deal with the Conservatives and they said we're putting X You mean the LNP? Absolutely. Yep. It definitely wasn't Labor and the Greens. Yeah, it definitely wasn't us. No, just, no, just I'm to sorry, it wasn't you either. Australian Conservatives. Yeah, it, was, it was only the people that we are absolutely opposed to are, are Labor and the Greens, yep. you know, with what they're going to do to this country. But the LNP decided they wanted to put a number of uh, One Nation people last, and they were pretty well the seats that we could have won in Queensland. We ended up getting 23% for the twenty-three of the primary vote across the state. We ran in 61 seats, extrapolated across the seat. That's 13.75% of the vote, but we got one member. I mean, the voting system is not what you call a really good voting system in this country. It should be more like the upper house in the federal Senate, which is proportional representation. In that case, we would have had 13 seats in the Queensland parliament, but hence we have one. And, uh, I'm, but there I, were seats where One Nation preferenced Labor candidates above yes, 
LNP we, candidates. And I, I should have finished that answer. We ended up after the LNP said, no, we're not going to do a preference deal with you, putting every sitting member last, every member, Labor and Liberal. That, that seems reckless to me. It seems like that is probably more likely to have resulted in um, the Labor balance of power, that Labor power that we have now. Dave, we, we, we've had this discuss, discussion on numerous occasions and are both parties at fault? Absolutely. Because it takes two people to start a fight. Yeah. And, you know, we probably shouldn't have done what we did, but also the LNP shouldn't have done what they did by saying yeah. no to another conservative group. And I, I actually put us in the position right now after what the Prime Minister's done today is I think we are one of the few conservative parties left in Australia. I think Lyle is one of them, and I'd say Catters are the other. And I think the LNP have now gone with Labor and the Greens. So if you regret, um, and don't let me put words in your in mouth if you don't regret. Oh, you but, won't. <laughs> but if you if you regret um, preferencing, you know, like both parties did wrong, I think is so, sort of what you were saying. Are you going to retaliate and just put Labor no. above LNP? Dave, well, what election? we did, we we have actually uh, put our proof where the pudding is because in the Longman by-election, we actually preferenced the LNP. The flow rate was 67% of preferences went from us yep. to the Conservatives. They lost, yep. but it wasn't through our doing. Their primary vote dropped from 49% to 29 And I think that's exactly what's going to happen now at the next federal election. Yep. Uh, the way it sits at the moment, and I, I can't talk on behalf of the leader of our party, but I would suggest that we'll just let people vote whoever they like. We can do a split ticket. It'll be up to the world. But Life is not a one-sided argument. If conservative forces had the intestinal fortitude to come together and they didn't do their petty bickering and it was all about power play with internally in their own parties and who can have the biggest apple pie or who can have the leather seat and they put the people of Australia first, I think they would all work together. Yep. That would be nice. But Now, I have to, be, have to be fair that Please. I, um, I generally wouldn't vote for One Nation, um, but in the last state election I did. Uh, and to be more accurate, I didn't vote for One Nation. I voted for the One Nation candidate in my electorate. Um, and, and this is probably the thing I want everybody watching this to do, is never, ever take a how to vote card from anybody. Nobody Good controls point. your vote unless you give them that control. Now, if you haven't thought about your vote at all, if you haven't done any research at all, a how to vote card from the party you would prefer to be in government is probably better than not thinking at all or wasting your vote otherwise. But think about your vote. Do do the research. Ask your local candidates um, how they represent you on the most important issues, such as abortion. And that's exactly how I decided my vote in the last election. I wrote to every single candidate in my seat and I said, do you support freedom of religion? Will you vote against abortion? Will you vote um, for the definition of marriage? And the One Nation candidate in my seat was the person who gave me the most satisfactory answers, and that's why he got my vote. Um, I didn't vote for the leader of the party, and I didn't vote for the party. I voted for the values that I wanted represented in my electorate, and it just happened to work in your party's favour on that time. David, I, I think you've nailed it. I mean, the Australian people aren't really aware. They think that we can tell them. Right. Where to put their vote? We Such can't. a common myth. You know, the LNP can't, the Labor Party can't. No, I mean it sincerely. I'd ask everybody out there, please vote for a conservative organisation ahead of the baby killers. That, that's the truth. Yeah, well said. But what you need to do is fill in every box, but you, you put the person at the top and the person the second, third, fourth, fifth, wherever you want to put them. What we give as a party, in my case or in Lyle's case, it's just a recommendation because we have to fill in every box. That's under the Electoral Act. We have to put a number in every box. So please just give us good people and give one of our lot the balance of power in the Australian Parliament because we're going to need it. Now, a question to both of you um, on about your parties generally: are, can, are all candidates in one nation across the nation um, allowed to vote for abortion um, bills if they want to, or is there a is there a party? Um, decision on this, that we will always oppose abortion? David, we, we've never had the opportunity and had the people in Parliament, but from my perspective, and I'm a leader of the party in Queensland, I, I'm a pretty opinionated sort of bloke, which I'm sure you're picking up here this evening. I'll be pushing to make sure people follow the, the line relating to abortion in particular. You know, the, there are many parties who say you, you, you can have a conscience vote, as the LNP did, and they, they exercised it. Yeah. They crossed the floor. Yep. And there, yeah, well, yeah, that that is, and look, while while we're there now, 
Um, it's one of the reasons why people should be joining parties is so that they can be in the room of 50 or 100 people Absolutely. deciding who the next candidate will be. And if the sitting member betrays the party position on that, and I think they should be free to do what they want. Um, I think they should go with their conscience. And then the party branch should be free to choose somebody whose conscience better represents them. I agree. Um, and that's where the freedom of conscience should be for both of them. It's, it's not a contradiction of the freedom of conscience. Um, Lyle, your answer to that same question? Yeah, all of our candidates that have been pre-selected are pro-life people. As I said earlier, uh, Corey Bernardi is pro-life, I'm pro-life. That's It's part of the values of our party. So it's an actual selection criteria for representing well, uh, the uh, Conservatives? Uh, uh, I don't know if it's an actual selection criteria, but it's what's happened uh, because okay. pro-life people have, have gravitated. Now, we've we've never been in Parliament yet. We've not had a, had a party room meeting, but um, uh, we're all pro-life. Our core is pro-life. That's the position of our party. Yep. Tisha, you want to have a comment on party positions? On yeah, definitely. The... We're running a Put Labor Last campaign. We are bipartisan, cherish life, but however... Non-partisan. Non-partisan. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I am getting a little bit bipartisan this election. <laughs> um, we're running Put Labor Last, and obviously that also means Greens. People know that means Greens. Uh, we're running a campaign hopefully in up to 33 electorates across Australia in conjunction with other pro-life communities and groups uh, just to really... We think we can snipe enough Labor people, including some Emily's listers, where we will get, we want an LNP government returned, who's in the upper house is not our business. Our business is to take out Labor because Labor's taking out the unborn. I do want to say one thing about the state election. Um, LNP, obviously three crossed the floor to vote with Labor, but there were still 36 who did the right thing. But LNP lost three seats because of One Nation preferencing. They were lost them to Labor, and that to me was devastating because this we knew ahead of the election that Labor, a vote for Labor at this state election was a vote for abortion to birth. We knew what they were going to do, so we campaigned heavily. heavily. And then when One Nation did the preferencing, it cost the LNP Redlands, um, Mansfield, and one other one, Aspley, and those three seats... You know, Labor had a huge majority, and who knows what could have happened if those stayed with the LNP. I know some LNP didn't do the right thing. That was three out of 36, but we had the majority of Labor, only one crossed the floor, and one abstained. So to my, my thinking, I was extremely disappointed for One Nation for that. And I also think a true Conservative Party definitely will always preference LNP above Labor no matter what because that's the majority Conservative Party as the two parties go. We have two major parties. We've got two tanks on the field. It's either going to be a Labor or LNP government. It's not going to be anyone else ruling government. Obviously, your parties, hopefully, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, look, I, I think I, it's I think concerning. I, I can jump in. I mean, look, I've only just met Steve tonight and, yeah. and I've followed him. I know he's a man of faith and, and has um, stood up for all the values that we all believe in. Yeah. But there's a reason people like me haven't joined One Nation. I mean, Pauline was seconding David Lionhelm's euthanasia bill uh, last last year in the parliament. Um, you know, I, I'm looking for a truly, you know, socially conservative and, and economically conservative party. Um, you know, One Nation has different views on tax cuts. Some days it supports it, some days it doesn't. So we're looking to be a party that is consistently conservative economically and on the, on the social values and, and, you know, I'm not wanting to be disrespectful, but that's my observations of One Nation mm. over the years has, has been perhaps a lack of consistency on some of those key issues. Yeah, yeah it's okay to question. be brutally honest here because we yeah, want to uh, explore the issues and have a chance David, to I'd like, them. I'd like to respond to both of those statements and I'll, yeah. I'll respond to the first one relating to the three members that did lose their seats and it's unfortunate they did, but I think there was about 10 uh, One Nation candidates who could have won seats that were actually put beneath Labor and the Greens the Conservatives back them. So if you put 10 against three, they'll give them 10 extra seats. They've been government today and I was one of them. They preference the LNP, preference Labor and the Greens ahead of myself. Am I, no, 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 if I let you have a speak. Yeah, if sure. I can have the same courtesy. What I'm really concerned about is, is Scott Morrison, a man of the cloth, has come out today to put another Conservative group left and put Labor and the Greens ahead of us. So if that's the same tactic that was used in Queensland and it failed, why would you do it again at a federal level? Lyle, relating to tax cuts, of which you spoke about a moment ago, we supported tax cuts up to $50 million. We didn't support tax cuts for multinational companies, the banks, and those people that pay little to no tax in this country. There are 372 multinational companies 
who pay little to no tax in this country. Our policy is to make them start paying tax so we can actually give pensioners a lift in their pension, so we can actually build dams and weirs and start to pay down the debt. We're very clear with what we do. There's nothing ambiguous about our direction. So I think clear message is we put Australian Australians first, we put Conservatives first, but I absolutely reject what you both put forward. Can I just say <laughs> something here? Yeah. Budrum, um, although LNP preference Labor above you, it went to an LNP. The 10 seats you're talking about were all predominantly LNP holds, so it's not apples No, they were Labor. A lot of no, them were Labor. Well, Budrum, Budrum went to an think LNP. Lo think Logan. It's a Labor seat. Logan it's would Logan. always go to Labor. Logan right. would never go to One Nation. We would have won. If we got preferences from the LNP, we would have won. Like, Probably not. Look, look he has a very up. big margin. I, please, I, please I look, study the numbers. This is my them. game. Oh, we I'm, got 31% of the primary vote. I, I think it's undisputed, though, that One Nation preferences did help Labor get over the line. That's and, and that's what gave us the, um, the Jackie Trad abortion to birth law. And I think that's a shame. Um, and, and, you know, on, on the tax cuts, um, Steve, I mean, a, a conservative, you know, um, will be had at, you know, you, you have me at tax cuts. Um, now, if people aren't paying taxes and multinational companies are not paying, that's, a, that's another matter. But uh, the principle of cutting taxes, uh, whether it's for multinationals, for big business or small business, that's a conservative principle because it helps the economy and that helps everyone. So if I and, can just yeah. jump in here, I, I struggle with the description conservative for one nation. Um, I get conservative sometimes, but not consistently. For example, seconding a, a pro-euthanasia yeah. bill is distinctly unconservative. Um, wanting to have a government-owned bank in Queensland is distinctly unconservative. Um, that, those are just a couple off the top of my head. David, I, I have nothing to do with the first statement you've made about the euthanasia bill. I don't know about it. I, I wasn't there when that occurred. Mm. Uh, secondly, about starting a bank. Well, I think it's a really good idea because I think most of the people of Australia have just seen the banking inquiry. Those bastards should be in jail. They've made farmers put guns to their heads. They've crucified our economy and it's all about profits for their own banking system. But a conservative think, doesn't say more government is the solution to to bad actors in, in the or, or even a, a totally bad industry. I mean, certainly there are things that should be done. You're absolutely right, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, and so government-owned institutions like banks, well, David, um, think, think, we can issue a couple more licences for banks no, and, I, I, and have I, the necessary competition. I would competition. think along these terms, and I, again, I, I apologise for butting in, but this is a very, very clear statement that I'm going to make. Think electricity. Peter Beatty said, when we sell electricity, it's going to get a whole lot cheaper. I'm sorry to say he lied. And mm. our power bills haven't gone down. They've gone through the roof. My advice to everybody out there is when you go to vote, take your power bill with you because it'll convince you that you shouldn't be voting for Labor, the yep. Greens, and anybody who doesn't want to build coal-fired power stations in this country. People can say coal-fired power stations are bad, but they're what produce cheap electricity. I'm sorry, solar and wind. Solar doesn't work at night, and wind doesn't work when it's not buying, and it will never produce baseload energy. Yep. What they're doing by not owning electricity is sending us down the path of becoming a third world country. Yep. And what they're doing about selling water, which they've done in Sydney as well, is sending us down the path of becoming a third world country. Our fishing industry in Australia now imports 87% fish products into Australia. They're sending us down a path of being having reliant upon every other country in the world. I mean, logic is very straightforward. There are some things the government should be involved in. Essential services, one of them, and that produces water and energy. They're at the top of the list. And if you can't provide those for the people of your state and your country, something's wrong. So maybe that doesn't make me a conservative, but makes me an Australian who really believes in our country. Well, it was very cold. Uh, it was August. I stood outside the abortion facility until I saw a couple approach. Then I went up to and approached them, and then I was arrested. There were two police officers, three detectives. I was asked to move on, and I refused to do that. The police officer read me my rights and then took me to the station. I knew that the prayer was extremely important at the location where the babies were being killed. We pray outside the abortion facilities and we offer help to women outside the abortion facilities. If a mother there does want to take advantage of our help, then we do everything that we can to provide whatever support she needs. Financial help, even uh, if she needs all of her hospital expenses paid for the birth of the baby, we take care of whatever she needs. This is the biggest human rights abuse of our time and in history. 
nobody wants to be seen as an extremist. Because there are so few of us, we appear to be extremists. We think abortion is extreme. Killing children is extreme. We are totally rational, normal people who are abhorred by the idea of babies being killed. Life advocacy outside the abortion facilities is an act of mercy to the women and the men who go in there and to the staff of the abortion facilities. So tell me about the power policy. Power is uh, clearly a crisis here, and um, I'd say a va vast majority of my viewers are going to be looking for um, votes right of centre, looking for candidates to vote for right of centre, which means they're looking for climate sceptics, people who aren't throwing their hands up in, in horror at the impending apocalypse of the world if we don't raise the price of electricity and completely throw away coal. Um, is a coal-fired power station nuclear? What are the, what are the solutions you want to do? Um, let's start with you, Steve, to um, address the, the cost of electricity and, if, if at all, the climate change. That it, our, our policy on electricity is very, very clear, and it's been similar to what it was at the last state election. Yes, we are pro-building coal-fired power stations, and the smart government would build them next to a, a coal extraction area so you don't have to transport costs for a start. But the point I made earlier about alternative energy, and this is the path we're going down, Labor is 50% renewables, and the Conservatives, I think, are 25 or around that figure. You'll have to uh, actually... That's right get it right, but I think it is 25. What it's going to do is absolutely decimate our economy, both. And I blame the UN. I blame the direction yep. of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And I think both parties should pull out of Paris. I think it is ridiculously imposting upon our economy. Yep. And it's going to break many, many businesses as it has done to a an engineering, engineering plan. So you yeah. want to build coal, you want to get out of Paris. Is nuclear on the table for Absolutely. one nation? Absolutely. We, we would look at nuclear in a heartbeat, but I don't think the Australian people are ready for it. When yeah. they think nuclear, they think Fukushima, they think nuclear explosions, yeah. but is probably one of the safest, greenest energies in the world. And I'm surprised the Greens aren't actually pushing yeah, it. But totally getting, getting to the well, point... They're the of, least environmental party in Australia. Getting to the point about where our electricity prices are going, there's a company in Bundaberg, they're 130 years old, an engineering plant, they're going to close because their energy costs are going up by 50%. You've got Tomico down in the Hutter Valley in New South Wales. They have 1,100 employees, a smelter. They do aluminium. They'll end up closing as well. But they're just the tip of the iceberg. It's going to be every business in this country. Mm. Business will not be able to operate unless we have cheap electricity. And it gets down to water as well. I mean, people do not have a vision for our country. If we don't build coal-fired power stations, if we don't build a hybrid of the Bradfield scheme and drought-proof this country, of which there hasn't been a major nation-building project built since the Snowy Mountain River scheme, I think Australia is in big trouble. And we are heading into an economic climate right now today where 31% of people who have mortgages in this country are now in mortgage stress. I remember back in the 80s, I borrowed a million and a quarter dollars and I paid 18 and a half percent. They're paying four and a half percent today. Think what happens when it gets to 8%. Yep. They've all lost the house. Yep. That's where we're going. I mean, is that the economy that we want to be in? And that gets back to the discussion we had earlier about having a state or a commonwealth owned bank. We're getting ripped off by the big banks. And why wouldn't it be fortuitous for the Australian government to have its own bank so it could lend to the Australian people? And I'm sorry to say it may break some of those four major national banks, but if people in our country can be assured that they are paying 7% for life for yep. a loan, or if we could lend our farmers money like we lent the car industry money, or we send $4.2 billion overseas to overseas countries in foreign aid, how about helping our farmers paying off their debt or replenishing their stock or taking water to inland Australia? You know, they, these, these are things that should be happening. In 1908, we I did it in Western Australia. I just want to ask Lyle, conservative positions on electricity for those... Um, <laughs> watching and yeah just um, if you haven't heard the conservative position for what's the solutions you're looking at for um, your position yeah. on electricity and climate yeah look we are um, not convinced by the so-called settled science that says that humans are causing the planet to warm therefore we should decarbonize our economy at uh, great cost uh, to 
um, our, our livelihoods and the economic prosperity. So we, um, we, we would have commonality there with, uh, with parties like One Nation. Um, when it comes to how you solve this, um, the electricity market in Australia is distorted because of the subsidies that have been poured into renewables on a massive scale. Um, we think those subsidies should stop. There should be um, uh, that the market should be allowed to to act, and if the government should uh, get itself involved, it should bundle together all of the power that the federal government uh, requires. I think it's you know somewhere in the order of half a billion dollars, might be four hundred million dollars a year, and and allow that to go to um, uh, a private sector actor who who would then build whether it's a coal or a nuclear um, baseload power. So that that's what we would. Um, proposed be the answer, not so much government building the power, but let the market do it. And if you allow the market to act in the way that it should be allowed to act without the distortion of the subsidies going to wind and solar, um, that would be a way of solving it. We would also um, allow, lift the moratorium on nuclear energy, which you know the Greens um, <laughs> have led Liberal and Labor in imposing on our country, which just shows that this whole climate issue is, has nothing to do with the climate at all, because if it did, the Greens would allow uh, nuclear energy, which is zero right. emissions, and you could have your industrial economy and you mm. could you know, have your zero emissions. But they don't want that. Their real agenda is to decarbonise and depopulate uh, the country because people are the vermin and uh, perhaps they want us all to live in caves and eat kale. I'm not sure. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Look, um, we, you mentioned the word racism before, that the, the One Nation, when you joined, was perceived as a, as a racist party. And uh, what we've seen from an Australian in New Zealand recently was undeniably racism at its, at its worst, most vile and most reprehensible. Um, I don't know of any conservative commentator, politician, candidate uh, who believes that that was um, a, a good um action for for anybody to undertake but a vast majority of the rhetoric coming from the leftist media complex and uh, a lot of um leftist politicians um essentially are accusing anybody who's a a shade less um welcoming of open borders than open borders basically if you have any kind of um, idea on restricting immigration they're accusing you of of or me us of fueling um, white supremacy violent um, murdering sprees um, is that racism to to not be uh, welcoming of open borders David what happened in New Zealand nobody can ever support that there's not a human being that I know that I've ever spoke to in my life that will condone the killing of innocent women and children. I don't care what religion you come from. I mean, that just should never, ever happen. But it shouldn't happen anywhere. Right. It shouldn't happen down at the Lindt Cafe. It shouldn't happen in New Zealand. It shouldn't happen in Africa. It shouldn't happen anywhere. And Agreed. there are people being murdered here every day for stupid reasons. And a lot of it is religion. I mean, let's look at the basis of you know religion. You, you've got Christianity and a fellow named Christ who actually loved people and taught us to love one another. And then you have uh, Islam, who uh, Muhammad, I, I'd ask you to look Muhammad up and see what he was known for. I don't think he was known for loving and um, treating people with uh, love and cherishing people's lives, but that, that's for people to look up themselves. Getting down to immigration and our policy, where we do sit, our policy is very clear. We want 75,000 coming in, 75,000 going out, zero net increase in immigration into our country. And the logic behind that is very clear. In the budget books last year from the federal government, there are 230,000 people coming to our country every year. That relates to a town or a city the size of Townsville and Rockhampton amalgamated together, which means you need the roads, the infrastructure, the schools, the police station, all that social infrastructure put in place. We can't afford it. We are $550 billion plus now in debt just for the federal government. It's mm. not including all the states. It's not including all the personal debt. I mean, where do these people think we are getting the money to cater for this increased population? We just can't do it. And then the other side of that argument also is, is the people that are coming to our country, and this is happening in our country today. There are youth, ga youth gang crimes down in Victoria, and they just happen to be Sudanese people that have come from other countries, and it's happening regularly. I'm not picking on them. That's just what the media reports. I've seen it. I think most people here in this room sees it. We need to be a little bit more picky and choosy about the people that we do allow into our country. You know, 
what do we want for the future of our country? Over many, many years, we've had the Greeks and the Italians and many people come here and they've assimilated into Australia. I think that's what we all want. I think that's what we all expect. But at the moment, we just can't keep up with the population growth for the reasons that I've already mentioned. Now, I saw David Koch um, incredibly inappropriately confront and essentially accuse Pauline of of um, promoting and encouraging white supremacy violence um, on with a with a question on on his show either this morning or yesterday morning. Uh, I actually think that line of questioning is um, at least as irresponsible as the rhetoric he's criticising. I, I think what happened to Pauline Hanson yesterday, I've never seen a woman put under the amount of pressure by two bullies, and I'll call them bullies, uh, Darren Hinch and also David Koch, they bullied Pauline Hanson yesterday, and I think the Australian people were extremely disappointed to see men in a position of authority like that shaking their hands in front of a woman for a start. That's unconscionable. It shouldn't happen. It should be rational, sensible debate. I mean, you know, we mightn't agree on everything here, but we're having a rational, sensible debate. That's well, what human I, beings I want to talk be. about the rhetoric, though, because it's not just David Koch. It's actually symbolic of, of this whole narrative from the left that if you criticise immigration, that if you think um, Australia's culture should be, um, you know, preserved in, in any way, that multiculturalism... Um, can go too far if it hasn't already gone too far, then you're actually directly um, contributing, if not responsible for, um, this massacre in New Zealand, which nobody is in favour of applauding or acknowledging, nearly nobody. But um, you know, I think that's I think that's really irresponsible to to say you're at fault for that. Nobody said that of the Democrat guy who shot up the Republican congressional baseball game when he shot all these Republican congressmen and their staffers while saying Bernie Sanders um, quotes and, and name. Nobody said, well, Bernie Sanders' rhetoric is responsible for that madman. That mad, and, and he wasn't. He, Bernie Sanders, you know, talks a robust criticism of, of um, Republicans and, and Trump. But that madman was a madman. Um, Bernie Sanders didn't say go to that congressional baseball game and shoot um, Republicans. Um, he wasn't responsible for that rhetoric, nor is uh, anybody right of centre who nobody's ever incited violence like that. And to and I think it's really really reckless of the media and leftist politicians to to draw a link that is not there. David, you, you, you've actually uh, you, you, you've nailed that in one statement. And I, and I really believe what you've said. And the Australian people need to really look at this because that's exactly what's happened. This has become a political ball now for the Labor Party and the Greens. They have basically thrown the challenge out to the world to stop robust discussion about immigration. That's really what they're doing. And please do not let me take away, and I will not take away from the heartache that is being felt by the New Zealand people. That man was a lone wolf. That man was a terrorist. That man was a person who, as far as I'm concerned, shouldn't be breathing with the rest of us. I'm really, really disappointed that somebody would place the rest of the world in that position and mm. take away loved ones from any family. But the Greens and the Labor Party are now stopping the discussion that you've articulated really well about talking about immigration. And do we need to talk about it leading into the federal election? Yes, we do. And if we don't, we're killing the freedom of speech in our country. And that, that's what really scares me at the moment. I've grown up in a world where we've seen man land and the moon, we've seen great technology leaps, and we've had very robust discussions. But what's happening today is, is don't talk about immigration because you're a racist if you do. And yeah, I think one of, the, uh, one of the key differences between our response to this shooting is um, in the wake, we're happy for the open criticism, critique and um, condemnation of the ideology behind a massacre every time there's a massacre. No matter, you know, let's let's authentically have a look. What you know, was he quoting this, and is it is it authentic? You know, can he actually find um, commands and, and consistencies within that ideology to act in that way? And I think whenever we see mass shootings and terrorism, um, you're you're pretty consistent to see it. It's consistent. Um, in the teachings of Muhammad, it's consistent in the teachings of white supremacists, and they should absolutely be condemned roundly, roundly, and analysed 
so that because in the West we see far less radicalization of of Islamic fundamentalists than we do in the Middle East because of the criticism. I, I think it's attributable to the criticism of those fund those ideologies. Mm -hmm. There's many, many, many times more um, Muslims in the West who just want to assimilate and be part of us and enjoy society, and they quite often come here for the culture of values that they're that's different from the culture that they're leaving. Lyle, I think um, I agree with what you're saying, and I agree with what Steve is saying. There's got to be uh, freedom to have a discussion about contentious issues like immigration and even the nature of Islam or, um, and the nature of Christianity for that matter. I mean, we need free speech. I think what's happened in the wake of this Christchurch tragedy, and it is an unmitigated, a shocking tragedy on, on its scale and the callousness uh, uh, which it took place. But um, I am going to be critical of um, Fraser Anning, and, and I've upset some of my fellow conservatives by doing that because he put out a statement where he said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. He said these people were not necessarily blameless. And, and if you read his statement, um, you don't have to, have to read it carefully. It's, it's there that he's, um, so he's attributing blame to these people because they were Muslims. Now, I take great exception to that. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of Islam, and I think there's plenty of uh, grounds to criticize Islam. But to suggest and to say and, and to distort the words of Jesus uh, that these people somehow uh, bore some guilt because of their association with Islam is just reprehensible. If they were people Agreed. lying strewn on the battlefields of Syria as ISIS fighters, yeah, you might say live by the sword, die by the sword. But these people were non-combatants. Right. Um, they are part of a religion uh, of which I don't agree with. But if um, if Muslim and, and there's lots of religions in Australia that I don't agree with. But um, if Muslims want to come here and live under our laws and in our culture and practice their religion uh, um, as part of Australia and, and Australian values, then that's fine. Um, but uh, don't, you know, obviously we don't want to see jihadists and people being radicalised and, um, and that should never be the case. But what Fraser Anning did in attributing blame to those innocent people, I think was terrible, has given all Conservatives a bad name and has actually kicked a big own goal, has given the Greens and the left a big leg up in their jihad to silence uh, debate. You got any thoughts or comments to join in the conversation? I probably shouldn't in my role as Cherry Shy, so I, I, I won't. Steve, do you want to comment on I, Fraser I, Anning? I, well, I think the Fraser Anning thing, he's spoken for himself, and I did ABC Radio the very next day, and what Fraser said is not acceptable. It was, it was an irrational statement to make. Uh, Senator Hanson yesterday on Sunrise was asked whether or not she'll vote on a sanction notice for Fraser Anning, and... But she's one of the smarter ladies that I've ever come across because her political antenna is very, very good. And she made the point very clear to the Australian people, there's going to be an election in eight weeks' time. I think the politicians are beating their chest. They're trying to take advantage of something that's happened in another country. It's absolutely terrible and disgusting. We've all said that tonight. We all agree upon it. But politicians should be getting on doing the job of making sure this never happens in New Zealand or here. They should be making sure that we are vetting people that do come into our country to make sure that we're not getting the wrong people coming here. And there, I understand there's about 400 uh, suspect terrorists living in our country now under watch, walking around our streets every day. We don't know where they are. We don't know who they are, but they're here. And when I was a minister in our cabinet room, we were briefed regularly about it's not a matter of if, but when we have a major terrorist attack in Australia. Fortunately, it still hasn't happened, but... I'm sorry to say, I think it's become inevitable part of our lives, but we've got to do everything to stop it. But th there is another thing that's happened, uh, and it's got to do with gun control. And gun control in New Zealand, they're changing all the rules and regulations over there, and I'm sure they're going to try to do that here again, even more so in Australia. We have some of the toughest gun laws in the world. You know, people had their guns taken off them by John Howard back in the late 80s, or 90s, I should say, and it was probably the right thing to do to the reaction to Port Arthur. So I believe there are many, many people in this country who have registered firearms, who have gone through every process you need to, you know, go shooting, to be in the Olympics, to do sporting shooting or to use, use your weapons on the land. And they're used every day. This is the Australian way that we have grown up and we have become used to. But I just don't want to see people demonised because they have a gun licence. I know what people can do with a truck. They can drive down the street and murder many people. Mm. 
they can set a bomb up and blow a building up. I mean, do you stop people driving cars? Do you stop selling the material that can make bombs? Or, you know, do you take guns off everybody? And I think the issue that I see there is that this seems to be happening globally, and it does seem to be coming out of the UN. They are directing what our country should and shouldn't be doing. They are directing how much water we should be able to use. They're telling us what sort of electricity we should be able to use. They're telling us that we should be a dumping ground for immigration. And I, I think people need to do a bit of research and find out where all these problems are coming from. Final question for the night. Um, to the best of your knowledge, if you've decided um, at this stage, how do you think your party's preferences will generally flow or be, be not flow, sorry, be recommended to um, on your how to vote cards um, with regards to other parties? Well, as of today, we probably need to have another discussion because we had a plan in place already that the, the Greens were last, Labor was above them, the Conservatives were above them and the majority of the other smaller parties above them. But as of today, since the Prime Minister has come out and said he's going to put one nation last, we will try to have discussions and we will work through this and come up with the best possible solution. But it, it's a moving feast at the moment. We were not ready for the Prime Minister to come out today. And being the religious man that he is, I would have expected to see a, a different call from him. But he's made that decision publicly and that's only happened today. So we'll need to have a discussion. Will you be that. putting um, minor right of centre parties above the uh, coalition? We're, we're conservative parties. We will always be going towards conservatives, uh, but that is up to our party organisation to have discussions after this event today because we don't know what the hell's gone on today. I mean, when you have Labor and the Greens and the Conservatives getting ready to vote together again, that really concerns me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Lyle? Uh, we haven't made final decisions on, on how our how to vote cards will be structured. Obviously, people can vote the way they like it is. Um, different at this election as it was the last one, but uh, I would imagine we would be, you know, probably preferencing the Liberal Party and then, you know, Liberal Nationals and then the other Conservative minor parties. But but that's not that's not my call necessarily. But it, it certainly will be Labor and the Greens uh, last. Um... Yep, very good. We're um, begging all the parties to put Labor last in their preferencing. Um, I've had many conversations. I know I rang Steve. Well, why Labor? Um, Labor not the Greens, Greens. Oh, Labor and Greens. Labor and Greens, gotcha. but our campaign's put yeah. Labor last because it's simple for people to remember. But yeah, definitely Greens last and then yeah. Labor second last. So I know I rang Steve a couple of weeks ago. I contacted Lyle and I spoke spoken to the Catters. Um, so I'm trying to get in touch with all the more conservative parties to say, please, from the pro-life community, we beg you to put Labor and Greens last. It doesn't sound like One Nation are going to do it, um, but we're, that's our hope because we, if we get Labor in, a vote for Labor, this election is a vote for abortion to birthright around Australia and us paying the $80 million bill to kill babies and harm women. It really yeah. harms women. Steve, Labor and Greens last. David, I, I think the big issue is, and I'm, I'm just going to call this shooting from the hip, you know, if we look at the polling that's going on at the moment, Labor are more than likely going to be in government in the lower house. And this is where vote, vote for Lyle, we'll vote for us, we'll vote for a conservative group because we don't get yeah. the balance of power mm. in the upper house, mm. we're buggered. That's the truth. But if we do get a conservative block in the upper house, we can stop all the stupidity of Labor. They just can't get through the upper house and we can block them. Yeah, That's the best I think we can hope for. And I'm, and, I'm just being pragmatic. And I, I agree with that, David. Um, and uh, you know, I'll go on a bit of a limb as well. Um, I mean, the ideal thing here in Queensland in terms of uh, the Senate composition would be for uh, Larissa Waters of the Greens to lose her Senate seat. Here, here. And for... Um, <laughs> And for you know myself and Malcolm Roberts from One Nation to to take those last two, you know, take the Fraser Anning seat and to take the Larissa Waters seat, that would be uh, the ideal scenario in my view. Yep, definitely. there's one better than that. We can get me and two, and we can take it another Labor person. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yes. Um, sorry, Steve. I should. Yeah, that would be. Um, I would agree with that as well. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. Uh, although Joe Lindgren might have something to say about that. We'll see how we go. <laughs> uh, we'll take out two Labors. Um, Titian, if people want to help um, help minimise the damage and, and reduce the likelihood of of uh, Emily's List pro-abortion, unrestricted um, candidates uh, being elected in their electorate, yeah. um, you've got a campaign going on to yeah. to help um, 
asked a few people. Yep. So we've got an Emily's List up in Townsville, which is a seat of Herbert. She's on a very small margin, Kathy O'Toole, it's about 0.2 of a percent. She's hopefully gone and we're doing a big campaign up in Townsville. Uh, we're also running a campaign hopefully in Longman, depending on our resources. So we've got Suzanne Lamb. She's an Emily's Lister. She has to go. She's on a small margin. Uh, Terry Butler here in Griffith, not too far. Her margin's a bit bigger. We're hoping we can take her out. But also we've got um, Emily's Lister's She'd running. She'd be fairly safe, wouldn't she? Look, her margin's about 1.6, but probably her okay. real margin is about five. She's very popular. So the Greens would be more of a threat to her, wouldn't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, there's also uh, George Christensen, who I know is a big pro-lifer. He's got a lady called Emma Hassan, who's an Emily's Lister, who's campaigning strongly against him. Um, Peter Dutton up in Dixon has Ali France, and she's looking like she's going to steal that seat from Peter Dutton. I prefer Peter Dutton any day of the week to an Emily's Lister, so we're campaigning Absolutely. there. Absolutely. So, um, and there's also Ross Faster has Joe Brisky running against him in Bonner. So yep. that's just a few of the seats we're doing some work in in Queensland, but that's happening right around Australia. These Emily's Listers are you know, they're well resourced. They have a lot of young women helping them. They get a lot of money. A lot of volunteers. Huge amount. Yeah, we're in a lot of trouble. When so I say we, we life is in a lot of trouble. And raise and match that. Yes. Um, now, cherishlifeqld.org.au, is that your website? Uh, cherishlife.org.au. Sorry, no yes. QLD, cherishlife.org.au. We'll put yep. that link beneath the video. Oh, thank you. Um, and you probably can't think of any off the top of your head, so I won't pressure you now. But if you know of any others where people can help, um, around outside of Queensland, yes, because um, this is a national audience. Yeah. Um, let us know. We'll put that link yes. beneath the video as well. Great. Um, and can I just, in wrapping up, um, strongly encourage you that this election is not an election which you should think about on election morning. This is an election that needs you in in the battle, not on the sidelines. This is an election where. Abortion is a federal election issue where taxpayers are going to be forced to fully fund killing innocent living humans in abortion clinics and public hospitals around the nation, where the federal government, if Labor is elected, will try and dictate state laws to the states that don't have legalized abortion. They will build an abortion facility in Tasmania. This is indistinguishable from slavery. It's an absolutely abhorrent violation of fundamental human rights. And it's not okay for us to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Please at least ask every single candidate in your electorate if they will vote against abortion if elected in the next parliament. And then tell them that you will decide your vote based on their response. And make sure you mean it. Be an undecided voter and genuinely look for pro-life candidates, anti-abortion candidates to represent you. There is no more important issue. And the amount of time it takes you to do this basic research to decide your own preferences is less than the time it takes to research buying a new fridge. And hopefully you care more about the future of Australians, unborn Australians, who will be slaughtered under these horrible procedures um, than you do about a fridge. And it's something that we can all do. But politicians will be influenced by you simply writing to them and saying, will you represent me? Because if you do, I will volunteer for you, I will vote for you, I will donate for you, and you can stick your sign on my fence. That's exactly what candidates are looking for. So make them work for it. And uh, thank you for watching. Thank you to the audience for being here tonight and for your questions. And uh, make sure you head to davepello.com where you can sign up to the newsletter and, uh, and follow, of course, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And all of these people, their contact details will also be in the link. Uh, their links will be in the description beneath the video. Um, but that's it for this Tuesday night. And uh, we can't wait till we do another live, live audience interview recording next time.